Well, good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome here today. I think we will have a, a very interesting discussion, so I will make a very short introduction. Uh, we have two uh, outstanding speakers today. Uh, we have Brian Hayes, MEP, former um, TD and former leader of the, the Fine Gael Group in the Shannad. Um, he will talk to us on a recent paper produced by Fine Gael MEPs uh, relating to uh, Ireland's role in security and defence of Europe. Our other speaker is Dr. Barbara Kunz, who um, uh, works for the French uh, um, Institute of International Relations, an independent think tank. She has extensive experience uh, in this, uh, in the area that we are discussing, uh, which today will be France, Germany, and the three dimension of Europe's defence debate. Uh, Dr. Kunz has uh, worked in uh, Sweden, uh, France, Germany, and in the United States also. So I think we will have a very interesting discussion. As usual, this is uh, the, the papers are the presentations are on the record, and the discussion afterwards is under Chatham House rules, which is that they are kept within uh, these walls. Um, anybody having a uh, mobile phone, no doubt, has turned it off. I have to make it. Quick check. I think mine is turned off. Um, so uh, we will start uh, straight away. And maybe Brian, if, if you would start off right. there. Thank you. So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mary, thank you very much indeed for the uh, the, uh, the welcome and the introduction. And um, just can I put on record uh, my congratulations to the IIEA for their excellent position papers that were published. Um, some months ago on the Future of Europe debate, uh, because I know it's very, very informative discussions uh, that we need to have right now. We're really framed by those debates. So many thanks indeed uh, for that, and also for the work that goes on in Brussels and elsewhere in terms of providing space for myself and other colleagues to, to talk about Europe on a regular basis. Um, we all very much uh, appreciate that, uh, those of us who, who are privileged enough to be MEPs. So re really what, what I want to do today is um, ask and answer three questions, if, if I may. Uh, the first question is, why did we produce this document as uh, four Fine Gael MEPs? Um, the second, and I'll try to answer that, and secondly, to, to go through it rather briefly, to, I mean, it's self-evident what we're saying, uh, not the most earth-shattering thing, but to go through it as best we can. And then finally, the last question, to, to, to ask this question about the future of potential common security and defence policy, common defence policy, call it what you will, in a context of the upcoming uh, MMF negotiations, the multi-annual financial framework for the European Union, uh, on the basis of uh, a European defence fund, what that means, uh, and what it means especially for Ireland, are there opportunities for Ireland? So there are the three questions I'm, I'm going to pose today, if it's okay. Before saying that, it's important to say that I think what one of the essence of a, uh, the rational legal system of government that I studied when I was in college is this simple contract between the voter and the, the, the government that um, if things go wrong for the citizen, the voter, the state is there for them. And if there's probably the most fundamental area of protection that democratic societies provide is, is, is defense and security and sense of protection. And I think um, it's changed, of course. The, the new threats that are there are evident for everyone to see. Uh, and it's important in that context that we reflect on how we are providing security and defense in our own country and across the European Union, of which we're members. But there's a wider debate as well, I think. And it's around the question of EU fundamental values, values like freedom, uh, tolerance, human rights, respect for diversity, uh, respect for the separation of powers. Um, the truth is, of course, that uh, these are uh, EU universal values, and they're values that we have to stand up for and defend. And the rather depressing thing is, if one looks at the developments, political developments that are pl taking place right now in Poland or uh, in, in Hungary, um, there are huge challenges for the European Union how one responds to that if one sees some kind of diminution of uh, those rights uh, uh, to other EU citizens. And therefore, this debate, I think, is taking place in that, uh, in that context. I think it was Professor Ivan Krustoff in his, his remarkable book, After Europe, that very slight book, but it really, it really packs a punch, 
in terms of speaking about this notion of the deja vu. Are we going through in Europe some kind of deja vu mo moment, a bit like what happened before uh, the Second World War, this notion that disaster can't come again. Uh, well, history shows us disaster can come again if you don't stand up for the things that you believe in and make sure that those values are universally uh, applied. So it is in a context of ongoing threats that Europe faces between unmanaged migration, uh, potentially uh, disorderly Brexit, looming challenge on the trade war front with President Trump, uh, that we have got to deal with these issues, and new issues as I describe as counterterrorism, cyber security, human trafficking. Uh, how does the debate on security and defence fit into trying to find some, uh, some solutions uh, to those problems, and how do politicians respond to that? On the first question that I asked uh, at the start, why did we produce this document? Well, well I think first and foremost, um, we have a responsibility to reflect the debate that is ongoing. We have joined PESCO. Uh, I welcome very much the fact that Dáil Éireann has approved uh, the decision of Ireland to join PESCO. And I think we have to be part of that debate. Where I sit in the European Parliament on a daily basis, I meet colleagues from different member states, from different regions of the European Union, who are very concerned about ongoing security and uh, uh, in internal and external security threats to their own uh, member states. And we have to be able to, to, to reflect that. So the debate in the Common Defence Union uh, is something that I think has to be part of our, our discussion. I think the, the and I think on, on PESCO, I think we've made a very good start. Uh, the fact that we have signed two of the 17 um, projects thus far, one on maritime surveillance and the other on security training, is a good start. Now, you could, you could challenge the government to say, could we have done more? Um, and I, I'm sure the government's reply uh, will be, we've, we've taken an incremental response to this, we're going to see how it goes. And I fully accept that. And I think probably the government's assessment of incremental engagement in PESCO is the right way to go. But I think the bigger issue is not so much what we're doing right now is. The bigger issue is, will we be part and parcel of trying to divide, devise and design the next number of projects which will be coming down the track? I think that will give us a much greater ownership and participation in PESCO. And one, one criticism I would make of uh, what happened in the Dáil just uh, last year was the very rushed nature of the debate. Um, joining the PESCO, in my view, is a very good thing. And things in politics uh, require debate, big, full, comprehensive debates. And it seems to me that when one rushes debates like that, uh, it is not a good place to be, because immediately things are thrown up and allegations are made uh, which, which don't help. So, from our perspective, as a group of four Fine Gael MEPs, the fact we've joined PESCO is a very good signal to our colleagues in the European Union and is something worth celebrating. Uh, the second reason we, we, we decided to put out this document um, is that we have to reflect other people's concerns as well in terms of this debate. There are huge concerns in relation to what's happening in Russia, uh, ISIS, how mass migration is, is being resolved or not resolved, as the case may be. If one looks at recent research by the Pew Research Centre, it's very clear uh, that uh, this, these questions are foremost in the minds of voters as we go into the next European Parliament elections, especially in continental Europe. And it seems to me that one of the responsibilities of Irish MEPs is not just to argue what things that Ireland needs, of course, we're elected to do that, but also try to reflect the broader European debate on these matters at home and to reflect that in a way uh, which is, is understandable. Um, so I think it is important that when I speak to colleagues from places like Latvia, Lith Lithuania, Estonia, and they speak to me about their concerns about President Putin, that I try to reflect that. It's as much an act of solidarity on my part or my colleagues' part to say that this, if, if it's an issue for the Baltic countries, it should be at least an issue for Ireland to understand what is taking place there. And the same is true in the debate in Finland and Sweden on how they're dealing with the neutrality question, how they're responding uh, to, to, to what they see uh, perceived to be Russian aggression. Uh, I have to understand that too. So we, we produce this document as a basis also of trying to understand uh, why this is a concern in other member states of the European Union. And I think thirdly, the reason we produce this document really is we have decided to stay in the European Union. It is our principal means of engaging with the world through this vastly important economic 
and the political bloc called the European Union. The fact that Britain are leaving the European Union uh, means uh, that I think we have to become more integrated with Europe. And I, I think, you know, in every political negotiation, uh, there, are, there are negotiations that are important. My concern, I've articulated this before, is that there is a sense in Brussels that um, we're less than supportive on some of the things that are required to make Europe work better. There's a mentality of a doctor know about Ireland right now. And that's a hard thing to say to my colleagues in government, uh, which, which I do from time to time. It's a hard thing to say um, to civil servants, to diplomats. Um, but I have to reflect that. I think we can do more. And I think the other argument is if we want to really win out in our core objectives of the country in other areas, we've got to become more integrationist. I would argue security and defense is one. I argue the EU budget is the, is the other. I argue that uh, doing more on migration is another area, making sure the capital markets union works. There is a diplomatic uh, game that has to be played here in terms of uh, safeguarding Ireland's real objectives uh, if we are uh, to succeed uh, at all. So this is a, a discussion document which is code for saying there is no agreement in Fine Gael about this. This is always a useful thing in politics, to put out discussion documents. Um, I know that. I've been around too long uh, to say, tell you otherwise. Um, I, I have to say also, can I say at this juncture, I was really impressed by the Fianna Fáil defence spokesperson at the time who responded to the De Pesco debate in the Dáil, Deputy Lisa Chambers, um, who gave a really fine contribution on that occasion. Uh, to the debate and showed, I think, great leadership. She subsequently got a new job on the Wiener Fall front bench. But what really this document is about is trying to have a broader political debate uh, in trying to um, see, a way, see a way forward. So what, what have we said in our document? Well, firstly, we said we need to involve ourselves fully with the ongoing debate on European Defence Union project to see exactly what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, my sense is that we are not moving anytime soon to a European army, <clears throat> despite the no posters of many years ago who used, you know, used to describe vote no to stop conscription of your young people. Um, <clears throat> we haven't seen that anytime soon, and I don't think we're going to see it any time into the future either. <clears throat> this idea of uh, our, our, our 17 and 18 year olds being kind of dragooned into a European army, don't see that happening right, right now. The other area is one of mutual defense. Um, I don't see that happening because it is uh, effectively illegal in Ireland because of, of, our, of, our, of our situation. What we have said in the document is, however, that if the outcome to this debate throws up the option of a mutual defence, we should look on it on its merits, but that if there was any fundamental change, it would require a referendum of the Irish people. And I'm very clear about that if there was any mutual defence uh, requirements from the debate, it would require that. Now, as I said earlier, we do have, under the Lisbon Treaty, the solidarity clause that is there. Uh, we've seen that put into effect in relation to Mali when the Paris attacks came. Uh, so we are moving ever so slowly towards a more integrated position on, on uh, European Defence Union. So uh, we, we, need to be, we need to be clear about that. Providing mutual assistance to, to other member states in difficulty, I think, is a, is a key moment. On the triple lock, um, as you know, uh, the triple lock requires the UN, the EU, sorry, the UN, <clears throat> the Dáil, and the government. What we've said is we might look at that on the question of EU or UN resolution. So in a circumstance where the UN, for political reasons in the Security Council, couldn't agree, and we saw that in the Macedonia case, most famously, uh, if, if, if one of the big countries refused to agree, we could look at engagement on the basis of an EU resolution. And uh, we think that's at least open for consideration. We've also said that the Dáil needs to be consulted. I, I have no principal objection with the Dáil deciding where we to commit troops. Absolutely agree with that. Um, but I do think we need to be more flexible on the ex exact nature of the triple lock. Uh, the third area is, I think, something that I think is very clear and dear to Irish hearts is on the whole question of peacekeeping, humanitarian relief. The Petersburg Tasks, which was part of a previous treaty, of course. I think it was Amsterdam at the time. Um, we think that's a very important area for Ireland to continue to focus on. What we're seeing in Operation Sophia is something that Irish people support. And the government's decision to incrementally do more in Operation Sophia over time is something that we very much support. Um, we've 
agreed with the white paper in terms of the size of the defense forces. We've been a little bit more ambitious in looking for 10,000. They say in the white paper, 9,500. <clears throat> and at the moment, of course, the, the GDP spending is about 0.3%. It's as low as Luxembourg. It's the lowest of all. Um, we think we should be over a period of years up to about 1%. Um, but there again, that will require, of course, on where the economy is. We've argued for a central intelligence uh, unit within government, uh, bringing together um, the Gardaí and the Defence Forces, even though they do different things on the intelligence front, making sure that we have, at a, a central intelligence area, the capacity to understand that intelligence and the capacity to use that intelligence for our own needs and also for that of our colleagues' needs in other states of the European Union. Um, we've argued a much more integrated position on cyber security uh, in terms of a, a working strategy with all our EU partners. Uh, we've argued for the establishment of a National Security Council to report and assess threats analysed uh, across uh, and to bring together all of the uh, political parties, NGOs, academics and indeed those of the public sector. We've also argued for an honest ad admission that we do have a defence industry in this country. No one talks about it. There are lots of very small and medium-sized Irish businesses, part and parcel of a supply line, part and parcel of research in defence, but no one talks about it. And uh, we should recognise that and also recognise the fact there are very significant other neutral countries, like Austria, which has a significant defence industry and spends significantly in that area as well. And we've also come, finally, for a review of the bilateral cooperation between the EU and, sorry, between Ireland and the UK as a consequence of, of, of Brexit. Um, we do have a section on neutrality, but as I said at the lunch just now, neutrality really isn't the biggest part of this document. Um, it's, 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 it's not because we're frightened of taking it on, and we've used other words there that might describe Irish neutrality into the future, uh, non-aligned militarily, or independent uh, non-aligned, or non-nuclear non-aligned. The bigger issue right now is to see what we can get from this process of integration and what we can give to the process of integration within a framework of, of a neutral country. So, you know, having fantastic ideological debates about neutrality really, you know, is great stuff. It'll have hundreds of thousands of people in the, in the teacher's club day in, day out. But I'm not so certain it'll actually will get us very far. So our focus is really on a few practical measures uh, that will help in that regard. And my final question that I posed um, um, is, is, is this. How does all of this fit in to uh, the ongoing debate on funding? Uh, because there's a number of things coming down the track which i just like to flag. Um, the good news is we're now a net contributor. Since 2014, we're poning up more money into the European Union. Um, but prepare yourself for a political debate in the next 10 to 15 years where people will start saying, actually, we shouldn't be giving any money to the European Union, forgetting about the 70 billion we've received since uh, the early 1970s. And also the good news in the context of the next MMF, the Multiannual Financial Framework, is that probably Ireland will be contributing, depending on where the economy is, somewhere between two to four billion over that seven-year financial envelope, which will get a lot of political coverage and a lot of uh, finger-wagging from uh, various newspapers and politicians about what Europe is doing with the money having forgotten about the fact of the last 40 years. So I think we need to have a debate at home about the EU budget, because it's clear in the proposal that has come from the Commission that there is a big new focus on security and defence, and there's a big new focus on innovation. And the next line of attack is going to be, in the run-up of the European Parliament elections, by some people, I suspect, that the farmers are losing out because, on the basis that the defence industry is, is winning. So we just need to just... Um, plug that myth a little bit. Firstly, I want to say I welcome what the Taoiseach said in Strasbourg in January where he said he is prepared to go beyond the 1% of GNI, uh, which others are not prepared right now. Very important message from Ireland, that we are prepared to pay more as a rich country that has done very well from the European Union. And I welcome what he said uh, in terms of, of that. Um, I also think it's, it's right to say we should, uh, in the new budget, see exactly what's in it. So. We have a, a figure of about 19 to 20 billion, cut three ways. Um, one is this question of connecting Europe, allowing for infrastructure uh, across the European Union. Secondly, the area of research. And thirdly, uh, co-financed project, uh, projects under PESCO. And my central argument, which we might come back to later on, my apologies for going on too long, is this. 
I believe the European Defence Fund is something good for Ireland. I think it's good for our defence forces. It's good for security capacity. There are many projects that we could pitch for with other countries which would provide savings for our defence forces. And I think we should see the opportunity uh, of the European Defence Fund uh, as a means of explaining to Irish voters uh, why it's important to work and collaborate with EU partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. I, I think you have helped to move the, the debate on from looking at what the definition of neutrality is to what the definition of solidarity within the context of the European Union is, and that, that is a, a much bigger debate. So we'll pass the floor to yourself to some aspects, uh, Dr. Barbara Kunz, on that wider debate of defence and security in the context of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation here to, to Dublin to talk about, well, French-German defence cooperation, but always in a European context, obviously. Um, before I start, maybe, maybe just a small disclaimer, and that is that um, when I say we, I, I mean Europe, and I don't even mean the European Union, but I really mean Europe, this continent. So when I talk about European security, it's not necessarily only CSDP. But I will get to that. And also what I would like to do in the 15 minutes I have here now is to not really get into all the nitty gritty of Franco-German defense cooperation on tanks and what have you, but really to try to, to see where France and Germany fit into the larger picture of the European uh, defense debate. Now, for France and Germany, I think that 2017, 18, and perhaps also 19, if the German government survives the, the current crisis, will be really decisive years, especially in the field of defense, also others. But uh, we've really seen new impetus in defense cooperation after years during which there was not much going on in the Franco-German relationship as such, but uh, in defense in particular. So that since last July, so the election of uh, Emmanuel Macron and then the first Franco-German summit uh, last July, as I said, we've seen some spectacular announcements and very high ambitions of what France and Germany want to do together. Um, what was perhaps announced as a flagship, uh, flagship um, measure back then was the alliance on the Sahel, that is French-German cooperation on Africa, which is also a long-standing French hope to get more help in, in the South, but I guess the, the most spectacular announcement was certainly in the industrial field and the announcement, well, there's, uh, it started already earlier, cooperation on a future tank, and then in July last year, the announcement that France and Germany would buy, well, basically a new airplane to, together. Um, this has surprised quite a number of observers. Um, it's been becoming more concrete with just new letters of intent signed th this week. So this is this is way in the way. And also, uh, perhaps to mention at this bilateral level, is that Paris and Berlin are again after 1963 with the originally Elysee Treaty that really set the course for reconciliation between the two countries and cooperation are now si uh, well negotiating a new Elysee Treaty, which will also um, contain a chapter on defense. Now, on the other hand, all these announcements notwithstanding, French-German defense cooperation has always been very difficult and <clears throat> somehow being the stepchild of this very close bilateral relationship, both sides have always had better friends, to, to put it that way, elsewhere. And uh, France and Germany are extremely different at the level of strategic culture and this has, of course, not, not changed. And uh, the perhaps I would say still most important difference between the two is at the very basic level, and that's the level of urgency. Um, how important defense and security at all are in, in the various national contexts. And they're, well, to be perhaps a bit blunt, but don't have time to be very, very precise here. I'd say that for France, defense obviously is a must have, whereas for Germany, it's still something of a nice to have, but something that's not really, really at the heart of uh, the political debate. Um, a look at <clears throat> the defense budgets in both countries and the, the debates surrounding them is certainly, certainly very enlightening in this context. Um, 
So to, to move on a bit quickly here on, on this Franco-German defense relationship, I think that as of 2018, what you can see is that France is still lacking the partner it would have liked to have in, in Germany, and that the disappointment is perhaps even peaking again, which is due to the fact that the Germans in the recent years have announced this new discourse that sometimes is labeled the Munich the Munich consensus and Germany wanting to assume more responsibility on the international stage, which has been seen in Paris, not perhaps by everybody, but by many people as a normalization of German defense and security policy. And uh, well, four years on, I think it's increasingly clear that Germany is still Germany and Germany is not becoming France. And that, uh, for instance, well, the German willingness to engage in military operations is still uh, not the same as the French. And uh, looking at these big projects that I just mentioned, these announcements on tanks and, and planes, I, it is also important to keep in mind that this might sound big, and it, it certainly is big, because if it works, it has the potential to restructure the European defense uh, industry. But there are also clouds hanging over it with the potential to poison the rest of the defense relationship, and that is um, the Franco-German debate on exports. Um, because you, once you build these products, you will have to export them in the end, because neither France nor Germany will buy enough of it to make it economically sustainable. But so much about the, the purely bilateral relationship. What I think is even more important is to look at France and Germany in the overall context of the European, and again, when I say European, I don't necessarily mean EU, and the European uh, security and defense debate. And I think here, this debate, in fact, has three different dimensions, or three debates that are often uh, that often take place in a separate manner. Of course, they are in reality they are linked, uh, but there's there's a number of instances where you can also see quite quite well, where you can see that we are actually talking past each other here in Europe, and these three three dimensions of the defense debates mean that we've moved on from these times when we're talking about the transatlantic link. I mean, before it used to be a debate on do we want to have security with the NATO or do we want the EU? But those, those, are day, those days are gone. Today we have three debates, as I see it, and that's the first one is the East versus South debate, where we should look at, where are the dangerous things. The second one is then confined indeed within the EU uh, context of CSDP, and that is basically about the level of ambition of CSDP, what we should do with CSDP, and this also boils down to the question of what EU strategic autonomy actually means. I'll get back to that in a minute. And then I think the third dimension of this debate uh, is sort of the elephant in the room here, and that is the future of US role in ensuring European, European security. Now looking at the, the first the first dimension, the east versus south dimension. I guess here it's very important to distinguish the security policy dimension from the defense policy uh, dimension. In terms of security, east versus south means that the, the south is basically about ma managing chaos and preventing it from spreading. The east is about keeping up the European security order. So these are already very, say, asymmetric tasks. If you look at it through a defense lens, this is the debate about crisis management in the South and collective territorial defense in the East. I think that's important because depending on what capital in Europe you are, everybody's talking about defense. But in Oslo, when they say defense, they talk about collective territorial defense. If you go to Paris, they talk about crisis management. And that's not, I'm not sure, always sure that there is enough awareness of these differences. Um, of course, East versus South, in, in reality, the debate makes no sense whatsoever because we simply need both. And we also have the North, uh, which is probably a third distinct uh, thing to look at. I mean, it's also implicitly about Russia, but the environment is so specific that the North would be a third dimension here. Now, if you look at France and Germany within all that, uh, common wisdom has it that the French look South and the Germans look East, which is right and wrong at the same time. Because predominantly, yes, but then they're both also engaged in the like other direction, to, to put it that way. 
And um, that also means that for, for France, there still is a certain priority on, on the south, which means that France has a priority in terms of force projection and uh, crisis management and interventions, which you can very clearly see from President Macron's uh, intervention initiative, for instance, or also the French-German debates you had about what PESCO in the end should be, uh, where there was this French willingness to make it into something where those willing and able would actually, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but in essence, I don't think it's wrong to say that the French initial idea, at least about PESCO, was to make it something that would help us in the South. Now, the, the Germans didn't really want to make PESCO into something to deal with the East, but the Germans more saw PESCO as uh, European integration. But if you look at uh, current developments in, in German defense and military policy, it's quite clear that the collective territorial defense uh, dimension is officially at the same level now than uh, uh, interventions, but in reality, this is, Germany is going back to having this as the structural uh, <clears throat> defining dimension of its security policy, and it's in good company there. I mean, it, at least in terms of number, because throughout Northern Europe, throughout Eastern Europe, to the extent that they ever abandoned it, this is this is the the new reality today. So here you have a first. So France and Germany being in different ends of this debate, which does, not, of course, not mean that positions are mutually exclusive, but difference, they are there. The second dimension is about CSCP and what to do with it, and uh, basically the definition of what strategic autonomy for the European Union, as it's written in the, the EU Global Strategy, what that does mean. And I guess that I already hinted at the fact that uh, there are quite different approaches here as well, with the French approach being about, well, mainly about interventions and having more capabilities available to actually do something, uh, and a German approach that is much more focused on seeing this as another instance of European integration rather than actual defense policy, which is, of course, also linked to the fact that Looking at the first dimension, for Germany, it's rather more the East, which also means that it's rather more NATO that is dealing with the real defense stuff, leaving CCP as an instance of European integration, which has its value as such, but is not so much about making the Europeans able to go south. Um, the third dimension, the US dimension, and the question of whether we can continue to rely on, on Washington here again, France and Germany are located at sort of different different ends of the the debate. And um, how, how to put it? I mean, but both both leaders, both Macron and Merkel, have called for well seeing the problems with Trump and taking Europe's fates into our own hands and so on. But if you look at the reality that's following from it, there's not so much so much going on there. What is clear, however, is that a, if the United States were to disappear, I mean, just painting scenarios here, if the US were to withdraw from ensuring European security, the blow is much, much bigger for Germany than it is for France. I mean, France is a nuclear power. It ensures its own survival to, to really go to, to the ultimate question. For, for Germany, it's the contrary. For Germany, it's the United States that ensure survival of the nation. Um, so the, the starting point in that debate uh, is, is also quite, quite a different one. And it's a debate that we're not yet having, that we should be having. And I'm not saying that because I'm anti-American or anything, but just because I think a look at the realities means that there is real big structural change underway in European security. And we should talk about this now rather than wait another 10 to, to 20 years. But the starting point here for France and Germany is quite different, uh, also in, in just pure psychological terms as well. So if you look at these three dimensions of the current European security debate, uh, you will see that France and Germany are not really on the same page on, on any of them. Of course, the, the differences between France and Germany are still smaller than the differences are between various other EU member states. But um, it, it is quite complicated. And um, to, to, in order to connect this, 
these three dimensions or the debates about these three dimensions, uh, it also, it's also important to keep in mind that things are getting even more complicated by issues such as, for instance, PASCO, where you so suddenly have a potential, at least, to blur the lines between between all these boundaries that we were used to, CCP being exclusively about military interventions. I mean, it's in a treaty, it's definitely like that. But then if you look at, for instance, the, the military mobility project, that's where you start to, to see blurred lines between all these southeast collective defense and so on, which to me is good news because that's a move closer to thinking about European security instead of thinking CSDP and NATO and all these other pillars, but what it does, it does, it puts some more pressure actually, I think, on all European states to really have a much more strategic approach to, to European security because it, it all becomes connected and what you do within PESCO has consequences on what you do, do elsewhere. But as I said, there is a number of divides within Europe and uh, what France and Germany should do, in my, my opinion, or have the the obligation to do is to, to actually lead away in debating that, not presenting the, the solution, but uh, to, to put this on the table, but which does not, does not mean that uh, everybody else is exempt from doing so, but that uh, this is a time where really European security is something that uh, should, be, should be of relevance in all debates and that should not be left to, to debating in, in these old categories of, uh, well, Atlanticists versus Europeanists and so on, but to really take all these three dimensions into account and try to come up with a unified vision of that. And I think my 15 minutes are over, so I'll end on that and look forward to the discussion.